Preface to In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Preface In one of the closing days of August 1905, the author of this work, Francis D. Germain, received the summons of her maker to join the silent majority the call came suddenly finding her in the full possession of her ever remarkable intellectual powers and with the ambition for much yet to do for nearly twenty-five years she had been at the head of the toledo public library in the upbuilding of which she was ever the inspiration and the guiding spirit with more than the ordinary capacity for organization and the practical she planned and carried out the working details of all notable improvements in that thoroughly modern library others who took up the work from which she retired about a year before her death will carry it forward with that devotion and capacity which it should inspire but they will but build additions to the edifice which she reared her death brought forth a remarkable outpouring of voluntary tributes to her worth and work from these has come the realization that by her death toledo has lost one whose influence upon its intellectual life was the most potent and far-reaching of any citizen it has ever lost living and working nobly in public as in her ideally perfect domestic life her loss is profoundly felt political administrations came and went party triumphs and party defeats lived out their little day and are long since forgot but year after year until a quarter of a century had nearly gone this brave and learned little woman ruled with gentle power and kindly wisdom the destinies of the toledo public library in the growth and development of this notable public institution selecting its contents the literary adviser of lawyers journalists educators and students she acquired with her discriminating judgment and retentive memory a remarkable knowledge of the contents of books a subject practically never arose upon which she could not at once give either the needed reference or the full information required and the library contained seventy thousand volumes in this reference work she became deeply impressed with the need of a concise history of the beginnings and development of our modern alphabet the information on the subject was widely scattered and very great it was found nowhere in a condensed and yet adequate form she knew from experience what the value to libraries educators and students generally a concise history upon the subject would be this she undertook and finally completed not confining her account to information gathered from works already published dealing with the subject she kept in constant correspondence with the leading archaeologists carrying on researches in both egypt and the valley of the tigris and euphrates thus she literally walked with these great scholars in the path of the alphabet and her work took on that original and valuable character based upon those most recent and wonderful discoveries which have forever silenced the voice of the higher criticism this work which we now reverently give to public print is therefore based upon her broad and deep knowledge upon the subject from original sources a work of patient labour of a profound christian faith a work begun and finished in that spirit by which alone the best work of god's labourers needs must be done upon her behalf grateful acknowledgment is here made to professor a h sace professor h v hilprecht professor james a craig and professor c r condor who walked with her in the path of the alphabet s p j toledo ohio december nineteen o six in memoriam from the loving hands of those to whom her life was an inspiration which shall abide end of preface chapter 1 of in the path of the alphabet 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2017. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter 1 of all the splendid achievements of archaeological research during the present century there are none of more universal interest and importance than those which are revealing the origin and history of letters this not alone for the historic values of these discoveries for their illumination of a past of which hitherto there was but a faint conception but also for what letters have to tell us in explanation or confirmation of biblical narrative of their bearing upon our most sacred beliefs at the beginning of the present century the great mass of testimony now laid open before us was an apparently impenetrable mystery egyptian hieroglyphics and cuneiform inscriptions yet remained for the most part but confusion of ornament and meaningless signs some little advance it is true had been reached during the latter part of the eighteenth century as to the signification of certain hieroglyphic characters but these were as yet but conjecture a groping in the dark with no means to verify uncertain unassured with the opening of the present century two events occurred which were to place in the hands of scholars the keys to these mysteries the first in date of these discoveries though not in results was the finding of the rosetta stone in seventeen ninety nine this was an outcome of the french scientific expedition to egypt under the first napoleon at this date a french artillery officer named boussard while digging among some ruins at fort st julian near rosetta discovered a large stone of black basalt covered with inscriptions this tablet now known as the rosetta stone was of irregular shape portions having been broken from the top and sides the inscriptions were in three kinds of writing, the upper text in hieroglyphic characters, the second in a later form of Egyptian writing, called enchorial or demotic, and the third was in Greek. No one of these had been entirely preserved. Of the hieroglyphic text a considerable portion was lacking, perhaps thirteen or fourteen lines at the beginning. From the demotic the ends of about half the lines were lost, while the greek text was nearly perfect with the exception of a few words at the end the immediate inferences were that these three inscriptions were but different forms of the same decree and that in the greek would be found some clue for the decipherment of the others it was first presented to the french institute at cairo where it was destined not long to remain the surrender of alexandria to the british in eighteen o one placed the rosetta stone by the terms of the treaty in the hands of the british commissioner this gentleman himself a zealous scholar and keenly alive to the importance of the treasure at once dispatched it to england where it was presented by george the third to the british museum a facsimile of the inscriptions was made in eighteen o two by the society of antiquaries of london and copies were soon distributed among the scholars of europe when the greek inscription was read it was found to be a decree by the priests of memphis in honour of king ptolemy epiphanes b c one hundred ninety eight that in acknowledgment of many and great benefits conferred upon them by this king they had ordered this decree should be engraved upon a tablet of hard stone in hieroglyphic enchorial and greek characters the first the writing sacred to the priests the second the language or script of the people and the third that of the greeks their rulers also that this decree so engraved should be set up in the temples of the first second and third orders near the image of the ever-living king it might be supposed that with this clue the work of decipherment would be readily accomplished on the contrary Many of the most distinguished scholars of Europe tried, during the twenty following years, without success. The chief obstacle in the way was the prevailing opinion that the pictorial forms of Egyptian hieroglyphs were mainly ideographic symbols of things. 
in consequence the absurd conceptions read into these characters led all who attempted the decipherment of these far away from the truth it is true that zoega a danish archaeologist and thomas young an english scholar each independently about seventeen eighty seven had made the discovery that the hieroglyphs in the ovals represented royal names and were perhaps alphabetic but the signification of these characters were never fully comprehended by either of these great scholars the claim made by the friends of mr young as the first discoverer of the true methods of decipherment rests upon the fact that he gave the true phonetic values to five of these characters in the spelling of the names of certain royal personages and in eighteen nineteen published an article announcing this discovery he seems however to have had so little confidence in this conception that he went no farther with it and still later in eighteen twenty three lost the prestige he might have gained by the publication as his belief that the egyptians never made use of signs to express sound until the time of the roman and greek invasions of egypt the real work of decipherment was reserved for champollion who born at grenoble in seventeen ninety was but nine years old when the famous stone was discovered which later on was to yield to him the long-lost language of the hieroglyphs among the characters of the rosetta stone in the hieroglyphic text were to be found certain pictorial forms enclosed in an oval it had hitherto been suggested that these ovals contained characters signifying royal names were these symbolic signs or how were they to be interpreted champollion concluded that some of these signs expressed sound and were alphabetic in character thus if the signs in the cartouche supposed to signify ptolemy could be found to be identical letter for letter with the ptolemaeus of the greek inscription an important proof would be obtained it so happened that on an obelisk found at philae there was a hieroglyphic inscription which according to a greek text on the same shaft should be that of cleopatra if then the signs for p t and l in ptolemaeus corresponded with the signs for p t and l in cleopatra the identity of these as alphabetic signs would be confirmed the comparison fully justified his theory and further confirmation was supplied by further comparisons until he finally came into possession of hieroglyphic signs for all the consonants again certain indications convinced him that these characters appearing in proper names must be also initial letters or initial sounds of egyptian words of which these signs were the pictorial representations if this was so the sign for the letter l which in the royal names was the picture of a lion must be the beginning of some word signifying lion which in old egyptian would begin with the letter or first syllabic sound of l the pictorial sign for the letter r was the mouth the word for mouth then in egyptian must begin with the letter or a syllabic sign for r and so forth the early opportunities which champollion had enjoyed for the preparation of his great work were peculiarly significant he was educated by his elder brother a man of great learning professor of greek in the academy of grenoble whose companionship early influenced the direction of his younger brother to linguistic studies in addition to this the intense interest aroused throughout europe by the vast collection of antiquities brought thither by the men of letters and science who accompanied napoleon's army in egypt had compelled the attention of scholars to this special field of research as never before with this guidance and moved by the spirit of the times champollion's studies in ancient greek led him to an early acquaintance with the coptic language it is said that as a result of this study at the age of sixteen he read a paper before his academy maintaining that the coptic was the language of the ancient egyptians this is not now a spoken language having been supplanted by the arabic since the seventeenth century a d it however survives in the service ritual of the coptic churches of today 
and though written in old greek characters the ancient language is still heard though but few understand it as champollion made use of his hieroglyphic alphabet for the spelling of other words than proper names his satisfaction may be imagined when he found that these were coptic words thus the sign for mouth for the letter r was the initial letter or syllabic sign of the coptic word ro signifying mouth the picture of a lion for the letter l also represented the initial letter or initial syllable of lavo the coptic term for lion the picture of an eagle representing the sign for the letter a is also the sign for the initial sound or letter in ahem the coptic for eagle and so on the language then of the hieroglyphs was coptic or rather in the coptic we have a survival of the ancient egyptian the language of the pyramid builders more correctly speaking it is the egyptian language of the ptolemaic period corrupted with arabic and greek idioms but still including the language of old egypt it was indeed a thing which might have been expected that the language expressed by the ancient hieroglyphs should bear a resemblance to coptic but that the resemblance should be as close as it has proved could scarcely have been expected again of special interest in this connection is the fact that in the greek the writing and language of egypt should be thus preserved the romans of language could go no further says mr butler than to join the speech of pharaoh and the writing of homer in the service book of an egyptian christian at this point a brief reference bridging the centuries from the decline of the use of hieroglyphics to the latter appearance of the language in its coptic and greek forms should have a place the extensive use of phoenician and greek alphabets in egypt and throughout the orient for some centuries before the christian era had affected the egyptian script as a social and commercial medium the hieroglyphics however held their own with the priesthood for sacred and secular uses until the time of the emperor traianus decius two hundred forty nine to two hundred fifty two a d which is the latest period in which we find them employed for monumental purposes a little over a century later with the spread of christianity the decline of paganism the destruction of the egyptian temples and the dispersion of the priesthood under the emperor theodosius the interpretation of the hieroglyphics was gradually lost not again to be read and understood until the discovery and interpretation of the rosetta stone in eighteen twenty two champollion announced the results of his studies to the academy of inscriptions of paris and followed this by the publication of his work on the hieroglyphic system of the ancient egyptians in which he discussed the proofs that the phonetic alphabet was used in the royal legends of all agents and is the key to the whole hieroglyphic system it will be remembered that those who before champollion had undertaken the decipherment of the egyptian hieroglyphics had based their efforts on the theory that these signs were mainly ideographic with this as a working theory all advance was impossible champollion on the contrary finding the egyptian system including a phonetic structure made this a basis for research achieving a brilliant success he never fully recognized the composite character of these phonetic signs from these he constructed an alphabet of nearly two hundred signs to which his pupil salvolini added one hundred more thus producing an alphabet of nearly three hundred characters as lepsius was to show a little later while these signs are all phonetic only a small number thirty-four in all are alphabetic the remainder representing syllables it is impossible in this brief survey to refer to the special advancements made by other distinguished scholars in this field of research since the death of champollion the work of decipherment has progressed steadily on until the life the literature and the language of the old egyptians are open pages which all may read there are however many things not yet fully understood of the rosetta stone two of the texts may now be said to be fully translated namely the greek 
and the hieroglyphic. This has not been possible until recently, in consequence of the mutilated condition of the tablet, a considerable portion of the hieroglyphic text and part of the demotic being included in the fragment broken off and lost. Not long ago, however, another steel was found at Ennobera, near Damamur, containing a duplicate copy of the Rosetta texts in perfect condition. This is now in the museum at Bulak. The demotic text has never yet been fully translated. This writing is a cursive script, developed from the hieratic to express the vulgar dialect spoken by the people. As hieratic bears the same relation to hieroglyphic that ordinary writing does to printing, so the demotic, which is a further abridgment of the hieratic, is compared to the latter as bearing the same relation which shorthand does to writing. Some of these latent signs have been identified, but not all. The first five lines of a papyrus, containing seventy-five lines, being the beginning of an ancient hymn addressed to the deity, are added in the original hieratic, with the transcription in hieroglyphic characters. The hieratic is read from right to left, the hieroglyphic from left to right. The dots in the middle or end of the lines, written in red ink in the original manuscript, indicate that this is a poetic composition. End of chapter 1「In the Path of the Alphabet」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in October 2017. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter 2 Cuneiform Inscriptions. The other event referred to, which was to open to scholars another field of research, in interest and importance equal to the Egyptian discoveries, was the work of Grotefend, early in the century, in the decipherment of cuneiform inscriptions. In many parts of Persia there are to be found engraved upon the native rocks, or upon ruined temples, inscriptions in peculiar characters. These characters are called cuneiform, because they are made up from combinations of a single sign resembling the head of an arrow or a thin wedge. This sign was formed in three ways, either horizontal, vertical, or angular. From these primary signs a great variety of combinations appear, either in groups or forming single characters. In the latter part of the 18th century, fragments of these inscriptions, and copies of others, had found their way to Europe and into the hands of scholars. Although some of the most powerful intellects of Europe had attempted their interpretation, but little, if any, progress had been made until the beginning of the past century. In the year 1802, Grotefend, then a young student in the University of Bonn, announced to his colleagues his success in the decipherment of a trilingual inscription copied by Niebuhr from the ruins of a royal palace at Persepolis. It will be remembered that this young scholar had no Rosetta stone, with an inscription in a known language to indicate either subject or language, simply the strange combinations of these singular signs. The inscriptions were in three different systems of assortment of the elemental signs, evidently representing three different languages, and as they were placed side by side, it was also evident that they were three versions of the same decree, or record of the same event. One of the versions, which always came first, was simpler than the others. This consisted of about forty signs, while the others were more complicated and numerous. Again, in this version, the groups of signs, which evidently formed words, were separated, each from the other, by a slanting wedge that did not appear in the others. Grotefend also observed that each inscription usually began with a certain group of words. One of these words, on different inscriptions, varied, while the other words of this group remained the same. 
by a happy guess he conceived these groups to be royal names and titles the words which varied on the different inscriptions to be names of different kings while the words which always continued the same in these groups were their titles upon this basis he began his work it was known to scholars that certain achaemenian princes darius and his successors had erected some of the monuments from which copies of the inscriptions were taken turning then to the older persian language of the time of darius for the spelling of the name of this king he gave alphabetic values to certain of these signs which he supposed might spell the name of darius also to the words which he supposed represented the titles of the king these alphabetic values were based upon the spelling of the name and titles in the ancient zend in this way he obtained supposed values of six letters in the cuneiform he then turned to another royal name which might be Circes. the name of darius in old persian or the zend is spelled d a r h e a u s c h again the name of Circes in persian is k h s c h h e r e now if the third sign in the spelling of the name darius was the same as the fifth sign in the spelling of the name Circes, in the zend this must have the phonetic value of r the comparison proved the correctness of this conception and again further confirmation appeared in another royal name artaxerxes where the latter part of the name was the same as the second royal name and the sign for the second character again corresponded with the letter r thus he compared letter by letter and sign by sign until he had found agreement in signs and sounds for the names of these kings and their titles Grotefend never succeeded much beyond this discovery, which was confined chiefly to the Persian inscription. The language of the others was unknown, and the characters peculiar and more numerous. They each evidently represented more ancient forms of writing, with complications not found in the simpler Persian version. Other scholars have, however, carried forward the work begun by Grotefend some of these reaching the same results independently as in the case of sir henry rawlinson who applied the same processes to the other trilingual inscriptions quite ignorant of grotefend's methods and with further success still to grotefend is due the honour of first discovering the clue to the cuneiform system and he it was who first laid the basis for future labours which wherever adopted has reached the most satisfactory results as rightly conjectured the other texts of the trilingual inscriptions are copies of the same decrees addressed to other peoples of the realm speaking different languages and possessing different systems of writing as a persian ruler of today publishes an edict in persian arabic and perhaps a turanian dialect so that it may be understood by all his subjects so the ancient persian kings put theirs into the languages and systems of writing peculiar to the principal races or people inhabiting the country it was not however until the discovery and translation of the inscriptions at nineveh that the full story of these persian inscriptions was distinctly revealed it was then found that the two other texts were addressed the one to a semitic people of persia the other to a Turanian people, descendants of the primitive inhabitants of the country. The close relations of these two systems of writing to the two similar systems found in Assyria and Babylonia were in evidence of the kinship of these separate races. Through the systematic arrangement of the vocabularies of the Semitic and Akkadian people found in the Ninevite remains, the secret of the persian trilingual inscriptions came to light revealing the extensive use of the cuneiform writing among the various people of western asia a significant fact in the early history of the decipherments of hieroglyphic and cuneiform characters are the coincidences in these narratives 
Thus, the keys to both interpretations came through the sound and spelling of the royal names. Again, the clue given by the Coptic to the sounds of the old Egyptian was also afforded by the ancient Zend, the sacred language of the Parsees. Notwithstanding the fact that alphabetic signs were the key to each of these systems of writing, we are not to find that either the hieroglyphic or cuneiform systems were founded on the alphabet. We are to find that alphabetism and a pure alphabet are not identical. We are also to find that before the simplicities of an alphabet are reached, the art of writing in all systems is a series of bewildering complications. Subjoined are illustrations of cuneiform vowels and consonants as written. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com in the path of the alphabet by francis germain chapter three phonetism while yielding to the charm of some master of language who of us gives a thought to the fact that the grace and flow the flexibility the mysterious eloquence of written speech is largely due to the invention of letters only twenty-six simple signs yet what marvels of simplicity and power in the readiness of these for new combinations their varied adjustments and readjustments in the formation of words we find the life and growth and practically unlimited expansion of language the rhythmical melodies of verse those inherent powers which render them so adaptive to the wants of man and withal so easy to be acquired Yet, writing without an alphabet is quite possible. In fact, the history of the past is revealing great nations and people in possession of systems of writing and of extensive literature, not founded on an alphabet. We are nevertheless to find that writing without an alphabet is a difficult and complicated matter, so serious and difficult that comparatively few could acquire the art, and that though in great measure this was confined to special classes, as the scribes who devoted themselves to the practice, and the priesthood who were invested with the power, yet the art of writing was understood and in common use to an extent incomprehensible when the difficulties of its acquirement are considered. The results were nevertheless to limit the extensions of knowledge, proving in all directions a barrier to progress truly has it been said that the history of our alphabet is the golden thread which entwines itself with the long story of man's civilization that it is the greatest triumph of the human mind and again as the most wonderful of intellectual achievements for we are coming to know that letters are an invention not spontaneous productions or miracles of language and that evolution as in other directions of human inquiry has much to say upon their origin and history though taking us to a past so remote the record for the greater part is singularly distinct and clear the story is however but a recent revelation not even as yet fully told gathering only sufficient coherence within the past forty years to make the telling intelligible or possible a fragment of inscription here a roll of papyrus there illuminated by the inspirations of genius and the ages which have so long withheld from us the story of our alphabet are slowly yielding the secret to give in brief review the leading facts in this story is the simple purpose of this history before entering upon our narrative however we can best understand the obstacles in this pass of research perhaps best understand letters themselves by a brief survey of the principle upon which the origin and development of graphic representation are said to depend perhaps we may see more clearly how scholars groping in the dark in their study of these unknown characters came to perceive first one fact and then another until the great story of letters was revealed 
we are thus first directed to the fact that at different periods of time in various parts of the globe different races of men each in their own way have invented methods of communicating with the absent and for the record of events independently of speech or the art of writing other methods employed by primitive man of communicating with his kind should first be noted thus the ancient gesture language common to all races and people whereby facial expression attitudes or gesticulations sorrow hatred love confidence regret all emotions were expressed that picture action which we find appearing in picture writing again objects representing ideas which were used as message bearers in illustration of this we have the story told by herodotus of the king of scythians who sent as gifts to darius when about to invade scythia a bird a mouse a frog and five arrows when the persians asked of the messengers the meaning of these gifts they would not explain but told them they should discover for themselves what these things signified the interpretation suggested by darius was that since a mouse is bred in the earth and a frog lives in the water the scythians gave up land and water the birds signified their speedy flight and the arrows the surrender of their arms to the persians not thus said gobias should you interpret this message it means o persians unless you become birds and fly into the air or mice and hide yourself beneath the earth or frogs and leap into the lakes ye shall never return to your homes but be smitten with these arrows akin to objects as message bearers is the knight's glove sent as a challenge to combat the pipe offered by the north american indian in token of amity the rosemary sent in remembrance or the rose as a token of affection other methods employed for sending messages are of curious interest as commonly used by people far removed from each other in time and place as the knotted cords of the chinese or the keepers of the peruvians which by their numbers the style of knotting or the distribution in groups were used as message bearers to all parts of the country in the same category also are the notched sticks of the north american indians the tally sticks of the danes the english and other people but while in different parts of the world human beings have invented ways of communicating with the absent without the art of writing to depict an object instead of conveying an object would result as a simpler and more lasting method of expression thus in simple pictures of objects we find the earliest beginnings of the art of writing how these may be employed as message bearers or for the record of events we have abundant illustration in the picture writings of the north american indian on the bark of trees or inscribed on rocks metal and stone in the same way in rude carvings with flint chips on bone and ivory records of the chase have come down to us from that far-off time when paleolithic man hunted the hairy rhinoceros the mammoth and the hyena in the forests of europe though hardly attaining the art of writing pictorial representations in kind were the earliest human attempt in this mode of expression later when pictures became the symbols of ideas as the picture of a bee to symbolize royalty of an eye to indicate seeing or knowing two legs to signify walking or going or a sparrow for cruelty or inferiority we reach a higher stage of progression relics or reminiscences often of the old gesture language or objects sent as symbols of ideas these two first stages in the development of the art of writing are known as ideograms where signs symbols or figures suggest the ideas of objects without expressing their names to construct a sentence in this way with the various parts of speech is impossible the next advance was phonetism the representation of the sound of words thus the picture of a lion or a camel will be understood whatever the language of the picture maker may be perhaps also symbols for things as the sun for light or an eye for seeing but how says Harine, can the names of persons as henry lewis and the like be distinguished by symbolic pictures 
this is true also of many other words without the adoption of signs or characters to represent sound or the names of things any adequate expression of facts or ideas is impossible it thus came about that when pictures of objects or symbols of ideas obtained a fixed and permanent sign for the sound in any language phonetism began among the confusions which appear at this stage are the homophones relics of that primitive stage in speech the monosyllabic when few sounds were used to express many things as an example in modern english we have such words as pear pear and pear or right 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 and right words so like in sound so unlike in meaning in our language these homophones for the greater part are defined by the variant spelling but as without an alphabet there could be no variant spelling other devices were necessary to indicate the various meanings of words having the same sound of these ingenious devices numerous clever though cumbrous yet so essential before letters appeared more hereafter in the meantime we find the same sound sign thus came to be used for words differing widely in sense and signification these sound signs were still picture writing in no sense were there letters or alphabetic characters but pictures of objects which were used to express sound this first stage in phonetism is therefore often called by philologists the rebus stage a distinct illustration of this method of sound representation is given in the rebus form of the sentence i can sail round the globe thus the pronoun i is expressed by the picture of an eye the verb can by the picture of a can sail by the picture of a boat or ship sail round by a circle and the word globe by a student's globe in this first stage of phonetism we find that pictures of objects do not represent these special objects as in the purely ideographic stage but the sound again that writing had reached the point where signs and symbols stand for entire words for a monosyllabic language this might suffice the necessities of a polysyllabic language however suggested a further advance this was to syllabism the second stage in phonetism and here signs are used to represent the separate articulations of which words are composed in an advanced stage of syllabism not all of the articulations of polysyllabic words were thus represented some sign attached to the word as a whole came to be used as the sound value of the initial syllable of the word this use of signs for the initial syllable of the word is one of those tricks of abbreviation to which the human mind inclines it is however scientifically known as an application of the acrologic principle that is the use of a sign primarily representing a word to denote its initial syllable not the initial sound thus we have the use of the letters c for century a d for anno domini and other familiar examples also the signs for the phoenician words alf beth gimel etc which came finally to appear as the initial letters of these words at the same time we are to remember that at this stage these simple signs are as yet representing syllables they do not as yet separate the vowels from the attached consonants denoting both together by a simple sign nor at this stage of writing was there any conception of such a division the vowel seems to have been regarded as inhering in the consonant as yet no way had been devised to express the vowel sounds we can however readily perceive that any attempt to treat pure syllabic signs alphabetically would be impossible the power of the sign for ni is not n the sign for ro is not r si si and su are not s and nor is tu t the selection of a number of such signs representing initial syllables of words is termed a syllabary 
its formation occurred when all or a greater part of the unions of single consonants with vowel sounds in a language had received each its phonetic and characteristic sign and was thus used independently of any previous signification of the word from which it was derived selections of these signs could be used almost as the alphabet is used to form words that they were not entirely depended upon by many intelligent nations that possessed a syllabary is one of the curiosities in the history of written speech the influence of the syllabaries which developed under different conditions in various languages is an exceedingly interesting study sometimes so increasing the simplicities of written speech as to nearly approach the powers of the alphabet again increasing the extraordinary complexities writing had assumed at the syllabic stage thus these syllabaries have been at once the despair and the illumination of scholars who attempting to decipher these unknown characters as letters could make nothing of them but when finally recognizing their syllabic values a wonderful period in the history of letters was revealed syllabic systems wherever found are a study of special significance so nearly alphabetic yet so remote always suggesting the greater simplicities to be and yet so oblivious of these simplicities but one step further and alphabetism is at hand instead of the use of the sign for the phonetic power of the syllable the use of this sign for the phonetic power of the letter was all that was necessary to many nations such an advance was inconceivable for this the conception of the elementary sound of which words are composed is necessary the vowels and the consonants the consonant being the chief power in this development it has been suggested that this advance when reached was the result of the prominence of the consonant in the syllable for instance the phonetic power of the consonant in the syllables sa si sai so su is constant while the vowels are variable the consonants thus appear to be the substantial elements of words while the vowels were complementary and inconstant in this way the sign for the syllable came finally to be the sign for the consonant with the vowel understood in confirmation of this we find that the first appearance of alphabetic writing that is where letters only are used for the formation of words was consonant writing the earliest nearest approach to a pure alphabet was an alphabet of consonants the semitic languages differ from all other idioms in structure the original roots of semitic words are triconsonantal consisting of three consonants out of a language so constructed it is easy to understand the development of such an alphabet the confusions of its use are also manifest thus in the changes of signification of the semitic root word k t b signifying right we have when spoken kataba he has written kutaba it has been written katabu writing and katubu written in script however whatever the signification in ancient form we have simply k t b with the many meanings supposed to be explained by the context in early semitic script there was no notation for vowel sounds nor did these appear until a comparatively recent date from this source as well as from the similarities which these consonantal signs assumed have arisen many embarrassments in the translation of hebrew and curious evidences in textual criticism with the semitic letters however we have reached the first alphabet not the first appearance of letters or alphabetic characters but that stage in the evolution of letters where these were used independently to express words at this point surveying the course from its beginnings we find the tendencies of progression are first simple pictures of objects again these simple pictures representing ideas then as denoting sound or the names of objects later on as syllabic signs and finally as letters along this line of progress there are however certain curious phenomena 
which record the historical course of writing as distinctly as do the successive deposits of geological periods while the tendency of all systems of writing is from ideographism to alphabetism not all reached this latter stage some gradually reached phonetism where they stopped others advanced to syllabism and there remained another singular circumstance is that this progress in phonetism is always without giving up ideographism that every stage is still picture writing again we find each stage of progress including previous steps of advance until at last as in the egyptian hieroglyphics we have the full series of pictures of objects and pictures for sound with a formidable array of, of determinatives and other special signs and significations this order of progress has been found so constantly true with all original systems of writing among all races near and remote that it may be regarded as a natural universal law there follows a chart showing valuable comparative examples of hieroglyphic and hieratic figures End of chapter 3chapter four of in the path of the alphabet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne spiegel in the path of the alphabet by francis germain chapter four syllabism many eminent philologists suggest a time in the history of human speech when language was monosyllabic when by a few simple utterances human beings were able to express many things indicating by gesture or tone which of the words having the same sound was the thing expressed later on we find language developed by the connection of two or three of these root words agglutinated or stuck together as one word by which this obtained a broader meaning this is the first stage in polysyllabism and is known as the agglutinative stage later human speech passed into the inflectional stage where these agglutinated words having coalesced or melted into one became so changed in time by phonetic corruption that finally it becomes impossible to determine which part was the original root and which the modifying element of the earlier stage of the monosyllabic stage in language the chinese is a distinguished example this language is referred to by many eminent philologists as the most primitive in structure of any living tongue it is a language of monosyllabic roots limited in number these roots possessing neither inflections nor parts of speech each word is a root and each root is a word which in turn may be used according to its place in a sentence as a verb noun an adjective a participle or some other grammatical form in speaking the chinese express these homophones by varying tones and gestures in writing their meaning is ingeniously explained by the use of two characters one of these is a phonogram which gives the sound of the word the other is an ideogram or picture form that explains which of the words having this sound is the one indicated these ideograms are styled keys and later on it will be observed are identical with the determinatives of the Assyrian and Egyptian systems. As an instance of the Chinese use of these keys is the phonogram, ha. This has eight distinct significations. Thus, it may denote a banana tree, a war chariot, a scar, a cry, or any other of its various significations according to the key associated with this phonogram. Thus, this language, possessing but a limited number of root words, is so expanded by the varying combinations of phonetic signs and ideographic characters that its acquisition for reading or writing is a formidable achievement some of the recent dictionaries of the english language record a vocabulary of two hundred thousand words to write any or all of these one needs only to learn the twenty-six signs of our alphabet to write a common business letter or to read an ordinary book in chinese it is necessary that the scribe or student should know familiarly from six to seven thousand of these groups of characters by which to express the forty or fifty thousand words in the vocabulary of the chinese again many of these characters are so similar in form that to write them accurately requires intense concentration and acute powers of memory 
notwithstanding this china has been a centre of culture and intellectual activity from her first appearance upon the stage of history from the earliest period the social and political system of the chinese has been based upon educational qualifications all political dignities honours and preferments by unalterable law and usage depend upon the educated abilities and scholarship of the candidates for office the rank of mandarin comes by no hereditary right nor by favor of a sovereign but through severe intellectual effort if in some cases this is obtained through corruption and bribery of some clever scholar who sells his literary privileges to some richer competitor this does not alter the case honors still go to scholarship it is said of these successful men the true students that it would be difficult to parallel them in any country for readiness with the pen and retentive memory if they are not highly educated it is due to their false system of educational merit which consists in an undue exercise of the memory at the expense of the thinking powers it is also due to the fact that it is a stereotyped system based upon an ancient usage and custom concerned with the past and ancient tradition rather than present or future progress the early history of this people is specially interesting in light of recent discoveries these suggest and the suggestions are confirmed in the ancient literature of the chinese that at a period about b c twenty five hundred these people made their first appearance in china from some locality south of the caspian sea in western asia this is supposed from certain historical correspondences to have been susiana and that their emigration was the result of political disturbances occurring throughout western asia at that date that driven from their early home they wandered eastward finally settling in the fertile districts of shan si and honan near the yellow river about the same time other families of this people settled to the south in anim from whence these kindred people finally spread all over china when they first came into the country they found their aboriginal tribes of various races in their historical annals the most important of these primitive inhabitants are referred to as the kwai people it is said of these that they practiced the art of writing and possessed a literature which is referred to by the chinese as the kwai books which included a treatise on music m de la coupre conjectures these primitive people to be of the assyrian stock of whom remnants are to be found in the present day in cambodia when the chinese came into the land they had a culture of their own they were advanced in the industrial arts and they possessed a system of writing and literature they date the origin of writing with them to a mythical emperor huang li who invented the art selecting for this purpose objects in the air and on the earth and in the world around substituting these representations or symbols of things for the knotted cords then in use modern chinese writing gives but a faint suggestion of a derivation from ancient pictographs these however can be traced by referring to archaic forms of these characters again in chinese words are formed by two characters the one representing the sound and the other the key which indicates the sound these two characters are so imposed the one upon the other as in a modern monograph or are so closely associated that to the uninitiated they appear as one character when however these characters are separated they bear often distinct resemblances to objects and in the archaic forms of these characters their picture origin is distinctly apparent dr s w williams in his work the middle kingdom volume one has illustrations showing fine examples of archaic and modern forms of chinese characters that are in evidence of the pictorial origin of the chinese system the references to the mythical emperor huang li who according to chinese annals invented their system of writing seems to have antedated the appearance of this people in china in their historical literature his name is written nakhon ti and he is so nearly identical in name character and works to the susian deity nakhun ti that the two are evidently the same this correspondence suggests the early association of the chinese with families of the same race who inhabited susiana in primitive times which continue in the names of other heroes common to akkadian legends and the annals of the chinese again the accordance of the chaldean and chinese chronology in astronomical and other scientific data cannot be regarded as accidental 
among many remarkable parallelisms in the literature of both races are the astrological chapters of the Shi king the most ancient of the dynastic histories of the chinese and an astrologic chapter in an akkadian document these have been translated by professor sace from the cuneiform who finds constant occurrence of the same expressions in both records relating to particular forecasts connected with certain planets as soldiers arise gold is exchanged and many others again the division of the chinese empire by the emperor yao into twelve portions governed by twelve pastor princes in imitation of the feudal system of ancient susa is another evidence of the former association or close contact of these distinct people in the literature of the chinese there is a work for which they claim the highest antiquity until recently no clue has been found for its interpretation this was the yi king or book of changes which has been a sealed mystery to the ablest chinese scholars of all ages including confucius its interpretation has however been accomplished by monsieur de la lucre who finds this work to be a collection of syllabaries such as are common in akkadian literature these are interspersed with chapters on astronomical and astrological lore others again refer to the ethnology of primitive inhabitants of the country all of these however taking the form of vocabularies only possible to interpret by recognizing their syllabic character the appearance of this work in ancient chinese literature is explained in two ways professor douglas regards this as an evidence that in bygone ages this language was polysyllabic he points to the fact that certain words indicate a form of polysyllabism and from this infers that the language as it now appears is an example of phonetic decay others on the contrary see in the occasional but rare evidences of agglutination the influence of contact with other races speaking an agglutinative or polysyllabic tongue and of which the above example in their ancient literature is perhaps a literary remains it is incredible that a race so advanced in polysyllabism as evidenced by the yi king or book of changes could revert to so pure a monosyllabism as is now presented by the chinese language phonetic decay is possible to many words in a language but so general a reversion to primitive conditions is scarcely possible of a whole language reference has been made in the chinese system of writing to their use of picture forms or ideographic signs in association with the phonograms to explain the meaning or particular use of these signs this principle so often referred to is by no means a special invention of the chinese but as we shall see occurs in all original pictorial systems of writing with the development of phonetism this is that when phonetic values begin to attach themselves to the primitive ideographs these are retained and attached to the signs expressing the primitive sound as if says professor sace to assist the memory in remembering the meaning and pronunciation of a particular word in this way evidently the keys of the chinese system had their origin as also the determinatives of the cuneiform the hieroglyphic systems of the egyptians the maya or mexican and other pictorial systems among the many advantages obtained from a purely syllabic or purely alphabetic system of writing is the easy adjustment of these signs to various forms of speech this is eminently true of alphabetic systems on the other hand the application of non-alphabetic characters to other than the original language to which these were adapted is by no means so simple and manageable in results we have seen how the chinese by the simple use of the phonogram and the ideogram were enabled by the structure of their language to retain this form without variation through the ages the tendency in polysyllabic languages after reaching the phonetic stage was to greater complexity and an increase of explanatory signs in systems of writing sometimes the transmissions of these primitive systems from one race to another led to simpler methods it however not infrequently happened that these transmissions led to greater complexity this depended somewhat upon the diversity between the languages spoken by the authors of the primitive systems of writing and those who adopted it while speech and mode of writing are distinct and independent the one of the other the influence of language structure in the evolution of graphic systems is conspicuous thus a sentence of english speech might be expressed by chinese characters or egyptian hieroglyphs 
in the tel armana tablets more than one language appears in the cuneiform we have seen how the so-called hittite characters were found on occasion yielding greek words and the use of the roman alphabet for french german italian and other languages are everyday examples the fact however remains that in the process of the development of primitive systems of writing before the use of an alphabet the influence of language structure upon the system of writing is an important factor in the case a curious phenomenon in the history of human speech is the preference shown by certain families of language for special combinations of vowels and consonants the simplest combination is of a single vowel with a preceding consonant in the formation of syllables for instance such words as honolulu mikado and others the japanese form their syllables only in this way the same is true of polynesian dialects and also certain families of language in africa south of the equator some distinguished philologists suggest this relation of consonant and vowel as survivals of the original elements of speech an example perhaps in language of the line of least resistance it is easier to utter sa than as ta than at and so on however this may be it is a notable fact that certain families of speech form their syllables only in this way again the semitic languages are alone in their use of three consonants in the formation of root words three consonants with their complementary vowels and no more other languages form their syllables with every possible combination of consonants and vowels some showing a preference for the consonants others for the vowels while again others combine their syllables as the case may be showing no decided preference for special combinations of vowels and consonants these conditions have had their influence on the development of graphic systems in the simplest combination of a consonant and vowel as sa si sai so su if the combining power is only one way and never another as as s is os us the number of syllables that can be formed in such a language are few and the number of signs to express these are consequently limited but when the combining power is both ways the number of possible syllables increases with every increase of these combinations of vowels and consonants and the number of signs correspondingly the transmission of the chinese system of writing to the japanese which occurred about the third century b c indicates this influence of language structure towards simplicity the japanese language is polysyllabic no syllable contains more than one vowel with a single preceding consonant in the adoption by the japanese of the chinese characters in the katakana syllabary a certain number of phonograms were selected which would give the sound of the unions of consonants and vowels in the japanese language as spoken this includes five vowels and fifteen consonants as these combine only in one way there are but seventy-five possible combinations of vowels and consonants in this language as some of these possible combinations never occur the use of forty-five of these syllabic signs are all that is necessary to form any word in the japanese language with the katakana syllabary in the formation of this syllabary the ideographic characters of the chinese system were found unnecessary and were rejected the result has been one of the best syllabaries that has ever been constructed the japanese have another syllabary the hirakana derived from a cursive script of the chinese this syllabary however is more complicated including with the syllabics a greater number of signs as variants and homophones in all nearly three hundred a marked contrast to the simplicity of the other it is however one among many instances we have in the evolution of letters where the simpler way seems so easy and evident but yet is not recognized end of chapter four Chapter 5 of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Chapter 5. In the narrative given of the decipherment of cuneiform writing, reference was made to the three distinct combinations of the arrow-headed or wedge-shaped characters in the trilingual inscriptions at first deciphered. 
it was found that these three distinct combinations of cuneiform signs represented three languages of three distinct races of men the persian an aryan people speaking an inflectional language the assyro babylonians semitic people who spoke a language related to the hebrew and the third a turanian people who spoke an agglutinative language allied to that of the modern turks or finns it was some time after the decipherment of the persian version of cuneiform texts before these facts became fully understood the semitic texts presented unusual difficulties while the language of the other versions remained for a time unknown the discoveries of mr layard shortly after on the site of ancient nineveh were to throw more light on the subject with the unearthing of the royal palace of azurbanipal at keunji the remains of the great library founded by this monarch were discovered beneath the ruins these remains consisted of more than twenty thousand bricks tablets and cylinders some of which were in fragments but a greater part entire and the inscriptions thereon as distinct as when first impressed in the soft clay this was a fine tenacious clay of the region which had been moulded into bricks and cylinders of various sizes upon which when moist the cuneiform letters had been impressed by a wooden or metal stylus they had then for the greater part been hardened by a slow fire and were thus made practically indestructible these cuneiform books were soon distributed in the great libraries and museums of europe and thus became accessible to scholars among these literary documents were found a large number which consisted of translations either interlinear or in parallel passages from a non-semitic language into assyro babylonian it appeared in two dialects the speech of the early people of northern babylonia the people of akkad and the speech of the primitive inhabitants of southern babylonia the people of sumir or shinar the close alliance of the peoples of akkad and sumir in race and language has led to the general application of the name akkadians to both families a closer distinction in general terms now adopted by scholars is sumerian further discoveries rapidly following the unearthing of the ninevite tablets confirmed the evidences that these people were the inventors of cuneiform and that the sumerian dialect represented the most ancient of the cuneiform scripts in the oldest inscriptions which have yet been found the characters are hardly as yet cuneiform the lines are straight and simple resembling somewhat the strokes and dashes appearing in words spelled by the electric telegraph code the arrangement of these is pictorial forming picture hieroglyphs and these were found to be ideographic and not phonetic by degrees the wedge-shaped and arrow-headed characters appear the pictorial forms are not so distinct and these characters express sound as well as ideas the story revealed by these older inscriptions was a genuine surprise to scholars it not only presented the remoter occupation of mesopotamia by a hitherto unknown people but also that while to mesopotamia is to be accorded the distinction as the motherland of the arts and the sciences it was not to its semitic inhabitants the assyrians and the babylonians of history that this is due here long before the appearance of a semitic people in the land scientific applications to the industrial arts were abundant an extensive system of irrigation and canals were in use in the arid regions and drainage for the lowlands near the sea the arts of metallurgy were practiced mathematics and geometry were applied to structures and astronomy to measurements of time and planetary movements they were builders of cities as we have seen they had invented a system of writing in certain cities they had schools for scribes and they had libraries where the literature thus developed was collected when we learn that this testimony takes us back to a date older than pyramids and to the earlier egyptian dynasties we may well exclaim at the astonishing facts archaeology is presenting until recently there were no evidences of a civilization in babylonia which approached the antiquity of egyptian monuments
in eighteen eighty three dr taylor placed the earliest dates from the cuneiform between two thousand seven hundred and three thousand b c recent discoveries however refer back to a period according to professor hilfrecht at least three millenniums earlier and point to a civilization distinct and original with the turanian races of asia preceding that of other races and people in these regions mesopotamia the land between the rivers is a tract of country extending about seven hundred miles from its northernmost boundaries near the mountains of armenia to the southernmost limit the persian gulf a range of hills crosses this region near the centre running east and west from the euphrates to the tigris north of these hills the country is the ancient assyria with its capital nineveh situated on the tigris south of these hills to the persian gulf is the ancient babylonia or chaldea where on the euphrates its later capital babylon was situated in the more ancient records assyria appears as akkad or agade the southern portion or babylonia as sumir or the land of shinar and later as chaldea for the greater portion this region is a dead level its monotony unbroken but for the rich verdure of the lands bordering upon these great rivers and the long lines of slightly elevated embankments marking the course of ancient or more recent canals and of the solitary mounds rising here and there from the plain these are the sites of ancient temples and cities and are sometimes very extensive the mounds of warka the ancient eric are nearly six miles in circumference and in some places rise to the height of one hundred feet the great mound of koyunjik covers an area of over one hundred acres in extent and is ninety-five feet high at its most elevated point that of nippur with the ruins of the great temple of bel rose over one hundred feet above the plains others are smaller and sometimes were intended to support but one palace or temple these mounds are artificial their foundations consisting of earth mixed with burned bricks in alternate layers the whole encased by a wall of bricks cemented with bitumen or as in assyria where stone could be obtained by a facing of stone masonry upon these artificial hills or mounds the inhabitants of mesopotamia from the most remote to later times built their cities their palaces their temples and other important structures the heavy rains of the winter season coursing down these declivities for so many centuries have in places worn deep ravines in the mounds through which the torrents have carried the crumbling debris far out upon the plain in this way many valuable relics have come to light bits of pottery inscribed bricks seals and cylinders the form and style of the inscriptions upon some of these indicating great antiquity these indications of greater antiquity include inscriptions on bricks for building purposes as well as those used for record and literature they include also the form and character of the inscriptions whether archaic or later cuneiform and again the use of bitumen or cement in masonry in primitive times the first bricks which succeeded the mud wall were sun-dried and were laid up with reeds and plastered with soft mud or bitumen this bitumen was applied hot and adhered so firmly to the brick that it is almost impossible to break them apart to obtain the cement and is one cause why the masonry consisting of sun-dried bricks has in many cases withstood the ages later the sun-dried bricks came to be used only for interior walls while for the outer walls bricks were made from selected clay and were carefully prepared and burned forming bricks of superior quality and strength so well have these withstood the ravages of time that some of the mounds notably those of later babylonian period are veritable quarries of building brick it is stated that the bricks of which the temples and palaces of babylon were built have for the past two thousand years supplied cities of the surrounding region with the material used in the construction of public and private edifices and that certain families of the babili tribe who claim to be direct descendants of the babylonians are exclusively employed in quarrying them as has been stated bitumen was used for laying the masonry in remoter times long before babylon was built 
of this substance an abundant supply was to be obtained at various places in southern mesopotamia near the arabian desert notably the neighborhood of ur now mughar the bitumined so called from the bituminous springs of the vicinity in time the use of this for masonry gave place to a fine white mortar made from a peculiar calcareous clay found near the arabian frontier to the west of the euphrates in southern mesopotamia for which lightness and strength has never been surpassed these evidences including also the inscriptions originally stamped upon the bricks with the name of the king or ruler under whose orders they had been prepared furnished indications of their time and place in history it thus came about that explorers following the work of bota layard george smith and others found their way to sites more ancient by many centuries than the beginnings of nineveh or babylon and have obtained from these records great historical importance the more ancient of these sites are in the southern portion of the country in that region anciently known as sumir or shinar and later as chaldea this was on the lower courses of the great rivers the tigris and euphrates toward the persian gulf this region abounds with the ruins of ancient cities as yet unexplored the most important cities of this region were eridu the most ancient and sacred now marked by the mud heaps of abu sharain the city of ur now Mughair, once a maritime and commercial city of these earlier times and of special interest as that ur of the chaldees the early home of abraham nippur or nefer the seat of older bel Telal, the ancient Sirgula and Larsa. The sites of Ir and Erdu, once near the sea, are now far inland. Erdu, formerly directly upon the shores of the Persian Gulf, is now 150 miles distant, while Ir, once situated at the mouth of the Euphrates, is now about 150 miles distant from that sea, and about six miles to the west of the present course of the Euphrates on the western banks of the older bed of the river, nearly opposite the point, though six miles away, where the Shal el Hik enters the Euphrates from the east as it approaches from its source in the Tigris. It is estimated that the alluvium brought down by these great rivers has encroached upon the Persian Gulf by the formation of land about 60 feet annually, creating a delta at the head of the Gulf, 90 miles in 3,000 years. These deposits have been more rapid in later times than anciently. The great cause of the difference between ancient and modern Chaldea is the neglect of the water courses. In ancient times, a well-arranged system of embankments and irrigating canals held these great rivers in their courses by distributing the superabundant waters of the great flood times to all parts of the country, thus enriching the soil with abundant water supply for all seasons. In the present neglected condition of this region, the floods as they come down from the mountain sources of the Euphrates are liable to wash away the banks, sometimes changing the course of the river and overflowing large tracts at slightly lower levels, which have become unwholesome marshes, while other tracts which are never inundated in the fierce heats become parched and desolate sand wastes. It is said that such spread is the waste of the Euphrates in its lower course, that except in flood time, but a small proportion of this great volume of water reaches the sea. These conditions do not so seriously affect the Tigris, which for the greater part of its course flows over a rocky bed between high embankments, and which, though a narrower, is deeper and swifter stream than the Euphrates. Within historic times, the Tigris and the Euphrates entered the sea by separate channels, nearly thirty miles apart. At the present time, and for many centuries, these two rivers have been united, forming the great river, the Shat el Arab, through which, in a course of about one hundred and twenty miles, the united waters reached the sea. End of chapter five. Chapter six of In the Path of the Alphabet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Path of the Alphabet by Francis Germain. Six. The Chaldean Field. The immense antiquity suggested in the maritime conditions at Ur and Eridu is again emphasized by the astronomical tablets. 
At this remote date, it appears that these ancient Turanian Chaldeans had traced the yearly course of the sun among the stars. The twelve constellations forming the signs of the zodiac had also been established by them, with the significations which have continued to the present day. They had divided the year into twelve months, and the first month of their year, which began with the vernal equinox, was named for the constellation, or zodiacal sign, which opened the year. This was Taurus, whose figure appears in these ancient calendars as leading the months at the beginning of the year. At the time this was prepared, the sun was in Taurus at the vernal equinox. About 2500 BC, the sun entered Aries at this period of the year, while the date when the sun entered Taurus at the vernal equinox was 47 BC. Other evidences from these principal cities of southern Mesopotamia present, in the remoter times, this land of Sumer as a populous, fertile, well-watered, and cultivated country. It was divided into small states, each surrounding a city containing a temple devoted to the service of certain astral divinities, as Ur, the city of the moon god, or Larsa, with its temple of the sun. Near these temples, and accessible from them, were the ziggurattas, the temple observatories for astronomical and astrological studies. They also had priestly colleges, schools for scribes, and libraries as at Erech, which was known as the City of Books. These small states with their cities were in ancient times each governed by patesi, priest kings, corresponding to the pastor princes of ancient China, or the Horsheshu of ancient Egypt. Later on, as certain of these priest kings became more powerful, the neighboring states and cities came under their domination, until finally we find all southern Mesopotamia ruled by kings of Sumer, and northern Mesopotamia by kings of Akkad. Of the explorations which have been undertaken of these older cities of Chaldea, the most extensive are those which have occurred on the sites of the ancient Nippur and at Tel Loh, the ancient Shirpulla. The former excavations, which have been conducted under the auspices of the University of Pennsylvania since the year 1888 to the present date, have recovered the most ancient remains as yet discovered of these older civilizations, dating, as estimated by Professor Hilfricht, from a period about 7000 BC. This includes the enormous structure dedicated to the older Bel, which had been rebuilt by successive monarchs, its later ruins rising to a height of over 100 feet above the plain, while its lower foundations reach as great a depth below. From this and other great buildings in the vicinity were obtained sacrificial vessels, marble and silver vases, objects in gold and bronze, stone door sockets, and over 30,000 clay tablets. These include remains from the earliest periods of civilization to the latest Babylonian history, from the earliest primitive Sumerian rulers to the latest Semitic kings. They give records of powerful kings as rulers of Akkad during the two millenniums preceding the reigns of the great Sargon and his son, Naram Sin. Of these two monarchs, a great number of inscribed objects have been obtained, some of the most important relics as yet discovered, verifying inscriptions found elsewhere of the extent of their power. Remains were also found here of later kings of Ur and other cities of this region, whose names elsewhere appear as great builders or restorers of ancient temples. Of this earlier period, that of the Patesi, or priest kings, some very wonderful records have been discovered by M. de Sarzec at Tel Loh. The group of mounds of which Tel Loh is the chief is the site of a very ancient city in southern Mesopotamia, the ancient Zirgul, or Sirgulla. It is situated between the Tigris and Euphrates, near the junction of the former river with the Shat el hik a small river which flows southwesterly to the Euphrates, connecting the waters of those two great rivers. The mound of Tel Loh, the mound of the idol, formed part of the royal quarter of the ancient city, rising at this point forty feet above the plain. It was in this locality that in 1880 to 1881, Monsieur de Sarzec, French consul at Baghdad, who was carrying on excavations in this region under the direction of the French government, came upon ten statues in the ruins of a very ancient structure. This proved to be the royal residence of an ancient king of Zirgul, the Patesi, or priest king, Gudea, 
whose date is fixed by various authorities at about 4800 B.C. The statues were nearly life-size, and all were headless. Two heads soon after were found in the ruins, one of them turbaned and the other uncovered and shaved, supposed to represent the king as priest. The type of feature reproduced in these finely sculptured heads is, unmistakably Turanian, of the Tartar branch of this great family, while the turban, another characteristic indication in costume, might serve for a copy in sculpture of the headdress worn by some living representative of this race in Central Asia at the present day. All these statues were inscribed, nine of them with memorials of Gudea, and the tenth of Urbahu, an earlier king who ruled in Zirgul before Gudea. The ruins of his palace were found by Monsieur de Sarzec below the palace of Gudea, and also the foundations of an ancient pyramid temple, first erected by Urbahu and rebuilt by Gudea. The inscriptions were in very archaic cuneiform, and were inscribed upon the robes of the figures. Upon the principal statue of Gudea were inscribed 336 lines of writing, divided into nine columns. About 130 characters are used, and these texts represent the longest of the ancient cuneiform writings found. The material of the statues is a peculiar variety of granite, a dark green diorite, one of the hardest of stones. This is nowhere to be found in Mesopotamia. So far as known, it only appears in the peninsula of Sinai. Again, the facility and skill and the manipulation of the material has indicated that the tools used for the work must have been of the hardest metals. They are supposed to have been of the hardest bronze. But this presupposes an amazing antiquity for the practice of metallurgy. The replies to the question, from whence the bronze, are now abundant, and come from a variety of sources. But the testimony from the inscriptions of the statues is the most direct and ample opening before us a commercial intercourse between nations and people of these regions scarcely suspected of such very remote dates there are indications that even in these early days tin from cornwall was exported to these far-off regions the inscriptions relate chiefly to the building of a pyramid temple by urbahu and on the gudea statues to the rebuilding of that temple by this later priest referring constantly to himself as patesi or priest king, he says that for this purpose his god, Nin Girsu, has opened the way for him from the Sea of the Highlands, the Persian Gulf, to the Upper Sea, the Mediterranean. I, says Gudea, made the lordly temple of the god who enlightens the darkness. Of costly woods I made it for him, with wood from Lebanon, Amenus, wood of seventy and fifty cubits. I raised its roof twenty-five cubits high. From the copper and silver mines of the Taurus, near the Great Pass, the gate of Syria, copper was brought for the great pillars. Marble also from the mountain of Canaan, to Dalem, in Phoenicia, for the foundations. He sent ships to Upper Egypt, where gold was obtained for the porch of the temple, to the country of Gubi, and the country of Nituk, which possesses every kind of tree, vessels to be laden with all sorts of trees for Sippara I have sent. Sippara, the city of the bright flame, was another name by which Zirgul was known. Reference to this comes in the inscriptions concerning the god who enlightens the darkness. Then of his statues, he says, Strong stone being brought from Magan, Sinaitic Peninsula, I made an image therewith, that my name may be remembered gloriously. Again of this statue, he says, Neither in silver, nor in copper, nor in tin, nor in bronze, let any one undertake the execution. An image yielding none of these, no man will demand his spoil. Made of hard stone, may it remain in the place thereof forever. These statues thus had a peculiar religious significance. Placed in the sacred temple, always before the god to whose service they were dedicated, they were supposed to represent the king constantly in life and, like the Ka statues of the Egyptian kings, to be the residence of the soul of the departed prince, which was thus ever reverently before his god. Thus we can understand the terrible curse pronounced by Gudea upon whosoever should remove this statue from its place. This and the companion statues from Tel-Loh were nevertheless sent to Paris and placed in the Louvre, 
where they will receive more distinction than has been accorded them for ages. Perhaps this, and also the fact that the inscriptions on them could not be read until they were placed where competent Assyriologists could have access to them, may induce the Ka of Gudea to revoke his maledictions, should they threaten this later disturber of his repose. However this may be, the view thus given of this far-off time, of which we have no trace in history, is one of the most interesting archaeological discoveries of the century. Here, long ages before the time of Hiram, king of Tyre, the friend of David and Solomon, long ages even before the days of Abraham, the ships of Gudea were navigating the seas from the trading ports of Ur and Eridu, then at the mouth of the Euphrates on the Persian Gulf, coasting down the shores of the Arabian Peninsula, which they circumnavigated, into the waters of the Red Sea, sailing northward to Magan, the enclosed port on the peninsula of Sinai, where the diorite for the statues was obtained, and perhaps copper also from the Wadi Magara, the land of bronze. Then to various trading ports of the Egyptian coasts, for gold from Meroe and for timber from Ethiopia, and then for the return voyage. Other confirmation of the trade communications of southern Mesopotamia with the peninsula of Sinai appears in the beautiful statue of Kefren, the builder of the second pyramid, now in the Bulak Museum. This statue was recently exhumed from the sands of the desert near the Great Sphinx in Egypt, and is a stone so similar to the diorite of the Tel Loch statues that it is evident that they were both obtained from the same source. We know in this connection that Seneferu, a predecessor of Kefren, had conquered and held in possession the Sinaitic Peninsula with a strong garrison of Egyptian troops, which were maintained here during his reign and the reign of his immediate successors, that under this protection the fine stone of this region was quarried, and that at Wadi Magara the rich mines of copper, turquoise, and other precious stones were worked. Another evidence of the contact of Gudea with Egypt is the fact that on the lap of the principal statue of Gudea the plan of the city is carved, and the scale of measurement used is the pyramid inch, instead of the Babylonian or Chaldean. Aside from this, the finish, detail, and workmanship of the Tel Loch statues is so similar in style and character to the statue of Kefren that they all suggest the same influence and the same school of sculpture. There are many evidences from other sources of the commercial intercourse between the Babylonians and Egyptians at these early dates, and it is probable that the cities of Eridu and Ur may have maintained the same relations in the prehistoric commerce of the Persian Gulf, which obtained in later times with Tyre and Sidon on the Mediterranean. The commercial horizon thus opening before us is a broad one, but is constantly extending. The natural depressions of the Mesopotamian Valley extend from the Persian Gulf northerly and northwesterly, thence through the Orontes Valley to the Mediterranean. In prehistoric times, and for long ages, this was the highway of nations, by the great rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, from sea to sea, the chief trade route between India and the western coasts of Asia Minor. Solomon is said to have founded Tadmor in the desert for the extensive trade from the Euphrates by Damascus to Jerusalem, whence the rich stuffs and spices from India were conveyed. Later on, Nebuchadnezzar established the port of Teridon on the Persian Gulf for the commerce brought from the southern seas destined for the great waterways, the Tigris and Euphrates, northwards. These facts are comparatively modern history to Gudea and his days, when the waters of the Persian Gulf washed the shores at Eridu, while ships from India, Ceylon, and the different trading ports on the Red Sea unloaded their cargoes on the docks of the great maritime city of Ur of the Chaldees. The city of Ur, then not far from the mouth of the Euphrates, was situated upon its western shores, and was, at this time and later, a city of great commercial and political importance, and the first capital of the kings of all Chaldea. As in all maritime cities trading with distant countries, people of various nationalities were gathered here. It is not improbable that the name of Ur of the Chaldees may have reference to certain families of foreign stock, the Chaldai, or Chaldi, who inhabited the regions round and about Ur, perhaps nomadic tribes from Arabia. 
Other authorities, however, speak of these Kaldai as a priest class, magicians and astrologers, possessing strange learning and speaking a peculiar language, as representatives also of the primitive inhabitants of the country, filling a sacred office and consulted by the king on all religious subjects. The divinity of this city was Hurki, or Sin, the great moon god, and here may be seen at the present day on the mounds of Mugher, the remains of an ancient temple dedicated to this deity, rising to the height of seventy feet above the plain. This was founded by Uruch, or Urgur, one of the earliest known of the kings of United Sumer, who exercised dominion over the greater portion of southern Mesopotamia. The remains of temples built by him are found in all of the larger of the ancient cities of this region, and the enormous proportions of these, and their number, have won for him the name of the Builder. It is evident that this king had at his command vast resources in human skill and industry. The Bowarie Mound at Warka is described as 200 feet square and 100 feet high, and that above 30 million bricks must have gone into its construction. Other structures on a similar scale, the remains of which are found at Erech, Larsa, Kalne, Ur, Nippur, and other cities in this region, show the magnitude of his resources and the extent of his authority. These buildings are, for the most part, temples dedicated to the tutelar divinity of each special locality, as at Larsa, where he erected a temple to the sun god, and at Kalne to Belus. The distinguishing features of his structures, which were continued in the later Babylonian temples, are the rectangular base, the peculiar orientation of these with their angles to the cardinal points, the rise and receding stages, the sloped walls, the buttresses for increased strength, the drains for the ventilation of the walls, the external staircases for ascent, and the ornamental shrine crowning the whole. The temple founded by Urgur at Ur was originally of great size. It rose in three receding stages to a vast height, where, upon the final platform, the temple was placed, containing the statue of the moon god, which was thus visible to a great distance from the surrounding plain. The lower stages of this structure were built of large bricks laid with bitumen. In the upper stages, the masonry is cemented with mortar. It appears that this was the work of two monarchs, Urgur and his son Dungi, who, as his successor, completed here, as elsewhere, the buildings unfinished by his father. The names of both kings are inscribed upon the bricks in the structure, and on the signet and clay cylinders found in the ruins. These kings are, however, of later date than Gudea. In their day, the priest kings of one city had become kings of many gathering various localities in Sumer under their dominion. Among the discoveries obtained during the explorations at Nippur by the Babylonian expedition of the University of Pennsylvania, there are many relics of Dungi and Urea, or Urgur. At this time, there are evidences of an organized priesthood in whose hands were placed the religious interests of the king and the people, who proclaimed to them the will of the gods as observed in the relations of the planets and the stars. In more primitive times, the religion of this people was pure shamanism, a worship of demons and the evil influences of nature, a religion common to all Turanian people even at the present day. Very early, however, in the history of this people, a recognition of the benign influences in nature is apparent, and while the older belief never became entirely extinct, yet the propitious influences were regarded as attributes of the higher gods. The sorcerers and magicians held a power of their own, but they were subject to the greater divinities by whose influence their mischiefs could be averted. Whether this religious development was brought about by contact with another race possessing nobler religious ideals, or was a development through their scientific applications of astronomy to astrology, it is impossible to say. However this may be, these higher religious conceptions had developed very early into a cult which became the inheritance of later races that came into contact with them. The peculiar and distinct civilization of these primitive Babylonians must have continued through long ages. Their system of writing had developed from the simple pictorial lines into the cuneiform, 
and these signs had become phonetic, expressing sound as well as ideas. They had also developed a syllabary. Finally, there are evidences of the gradual increase among them of another race of people. This was a Semitic people, who seem at first to have established themselves in northern Babylonia in the kingdom of Akkad, finally becoming supreme in the land. About 3800 BC, the kingdoms of Akkad and Sumer are found united under Sargon I, a Semitic king. There are indications of Akkadian or Sumerian kings who ruled over the separate kingdoms of Akkad and Sumer at earlier and later dates, but the main course of testimony after Sargon I tells of Semitic kings as rulers in northern Babylonia, or Akkad, and a Semitic influence dominant there. The influence of such close social contact brought about material changes in the life, literature, and language of both people. In Akkad, which came first under Semitic influence, the old language rapidly declined. In Sumer, or southern Mesopotamia, which continued much longer under the ancient rule and influence, the old language held its own down to comparatively recent times. The Semites, however, seem to have received from the Akkadians more than they gave. The arts and sciences and civilization of this ancient people became the arts and sciences and civilization of the Semitic, Assyrians, and Babylonians. They appropriated the religion and gods of these early Chaldeans. They became heirs of their literature, and they adopted their system of writing. The most curious instance of these various adoptions of the Semites was the Sumerian syllabary. Now, in applying the syllabary of one language to the uses of another, it might be expected that the signs expressing a certain syllabic sound in one language would be used to express the syllabic sounds in the other. This, however, was not the case in this instance. When the Semites adopted the old Akkadian syllabary, they used these signs quite as often to express the Semitic sounds of the original ideographs, as for syllabic signs. As an instance of this curious example of polyphony, Mr. Taylor gives the cuneiform sign, which in the primitive pictorial form represented an ear. The name of ear in Akkadian is B. This sign had another syllabic value, signifying a drop of water. When the Semites adopted this sign to their uses, they retained the phonetic value of the sign as B. They, however, used this sign also to express the sound of the Semitic words Eznu, an ear, and Giltanu, a drop of water. This use of signs is the reverse of homophonism, where, by the use of one sign, many words having the same sound are expressed. It is an instance of polyphonism, where one sign is used to express words having different sounds. The result was, however, the same. It led, in both cases, to the increase of determinatives and other explanatory signs to indicate the word to be expressed by the sign. The use of ideographs as determinatives was evidently suggested by the Sumerian syllabary, but the language of the Sumerians was simple, requiring fewer signs to express sounds. On the contrary, the Semitic language was more copious, possessing a greater variety of syllabic utterances. It will thus be seen that when the decipherment of the Assyrian cuneiform was first attempted, scholars could not for a time master the curious complications they found. The Assyrian syllabary could only be explained as a foreign importation, not as an evolution from a Semitic speech. As Professor Sace says, like the discoverers of the planet Uranus, they had to presuppose another language to account for its origin and appearance. The decipherment of the older cuneiform soon after, and the discovery of the bilingual texts, where copies from the old Sumerian originals were placed side by side with the Semitic translations, soon explained the sources of confusion, the original values of these signs, and their application to another language. End of six. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land.